Remember when we broke the news by showing you a secret document, a multi-million dollar campaign plan attacking Canada's oil sands and pipelines cooked up by New York's Rockefeller Brothers Fund back in 2008? It's a 48-page campaign battle plan detailing everything from their budget to the lobby group frontmen they plan to hire in Canada to hide the fact that they're running the show from the U.S. They basically acknowledge that they couldn't stop the oil sands themselves. But as you can see by their detailed maps, they plan on stopping all of the pipelines coming out of the oil sands. No plans for taking on Saudi oil or Venezuelan oil or Iranian oil or Russian oil. No, that's too tough to do. Those are military dictatorships or at least authoritarian regimes run by thugs like Vladimir Putin, the former KGB agent who don't designate kindly to foreigners meddling in their chief industries. Now, the Rockefeller brothers bravely took on the world's gentlest oil and gas producer, Canada. They're actually fine with OPEC. Now, as we showed you, they have a $7 million a year budget. And their number one tactic is lawyers gumming up things with lawsuits and objections. The most important revelation, though, is on page 36 of their plan, where the Rockefellers acknowledge that a bunch of white billionaires from New York aren't exactly going to persuade Canadians to cut thousands of our jobs. So look, they explicitly say they want to hire apples to put a red outside on a white campaign. Look, First Nations and other legal challenges, they write. So you got a bunch of billionaires in New York basically saying, call up Central Casting. We need an Indian to block this thing in Canada for us. We need some window dressing to pretend it's not just us billionaires. The front page of the Washington Post today confirms just how white and privileged the U.S. environmentalist movement is. I mean, it only makes sense. People who are very rich can afford the energy poverty that results when you shut down the production of oil and gas or make it expensive through carbon taxes and regulations or other rationing. Only wealthy people can afford overpriced hybrid cars that don't even really help the environment. They're just some trophy that rich people can use to prove how righteous they are. <laughs> oh, and rich, too. Take Robert F. Kennedy Jr., another silver spoon millionaire who inherited his wealth and his instinct to tell other people what to do. His Water Keepers, that's the name of his rich kids environmental club, has precisely one black member out of 200 water keepers. I mean, that's whiter than the Republicans. That's, that's whiter than the Wheat Board. That's almost whiter than the Ku Klux Klan. Now, don't take it from me. Take it from the Indians that Kennedy and the Rockefellers sometimes call to hire for a splash of color. Let me quote from that front page Washington Post story today. Quote, Tom Goldtooth, executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network based in Minnesota, said they need, quote, to put a human face on the issue. Goldtooth said his network works with groups such as the National Wildlife Federation attempting to stop the Keystone oil pipeline from extending across native lands from Canada to Texas. But big groups generally approach them only when they need something. Ah, a human face, eh? Nah, rich people have human faces. They just have the faces of very white, very rich, very old people like the Rockefellers. Uh, they need to pretend they're grassrootsy. And as the Rockefeller Brothers campaign plan showed, they need to pretend they're Canadian and Aboriginal. Now, the producers of the movie Dances with Wolves were as white as Newt Gingrich, so they hired some Indians to play act. Same with the Rockefellers. But things haven't been going their way. I know it feels like the anti-oil sands people are winning this fight, but they're actually not. I mean, new oil sands projects are being built all the time. There is a bottleneck on the pipeline side, to be sure, but that's being met by railways that now ship more than a third of a million barrels of oil each day by train. I mean, it costs a bit more than a pipeline, and though it's still very safe, it's not quite as super safe as pipelines are, but it's happening. And, of course, the Rockefellers' war on Canada has made us a little bit prouder as a nation, a little more nationalistic. Now, the hottest new idea in Canada is to sell our Canadian oil sands oil to eastern Canada, including to Canada's largest refinery, the Irving Refinery in New Brunswick. Oh, our oil will be sold. The Northern Gateway Pipeline hearings continue forward for a new pipeline to the B.C. coast. There's another proposal to double the size of an existing pipeline to the B.C. coast in Vancouver called the Trans Mountain Pipeline. That might actually be approved sooner since it already exists. There are no new land claims or negotiations needed. And even the Keystone XL pipeline to the states received a big boost last month when the U.S. Department of State released a 2,000-page study saying it wouldn't have any adverse environmental impact. And just last week, the U.S. Senate voted to give the Keystone XL a symbolic vote of approval. And look at the margin of that vote. Any... Any senators present in the chamber wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, then the ayes are 62, 
The nays are 37. The amendment is agreed to. 62 to 37 in favor of the Keystone XL. As you may know, there are only 45 Republicans in the U.S. Senate. So Democrats are now supporting the Keystone XL pipeline, too. It's working. Not as fast as it should. And every day and every month that these pipelines are delayed is another day or month that the world is forced to buy conflict oil from Saudi Arabia or Venezuela instead of ethical oil from Canada. But things are moving in the right direction. So what's a poor New York billionaire to do? Well, double down on money. That's what they've got, right? I mean, uh, if you thought that Rockefellers had a lot of dough, well, let me introduce you to the Hewlett Foundation, named after the man who invented HP computers. At the same time that the Rockefeller brothers decided to spend $7 million a year fighting against Canadian jobs, look at what the Hewlett Foundation decided to do. This is from their website. The Hewlett Foundation decided to make a five-year, $100 million a year commitment beginning in 2008 to Climate Works. That's a lobby group. That's not a typo, folks. For five years in a row, one foundation alone, the Hewlett Foundation, has been spending a hundred million dollars a year. Just one foundation. Just have to think about that. I don't think that all the oil sands companies combined are spending even half that in pro-oil sands advocacy. I don't think the oil companies plus the province of Alberta plus the federal government are spending half that. And that's just one foundation. There are plenty more like it. There's the Tides Foundation out of San Francisco that funds 36 different anti-oil sands NGOs in Canada. Like the David Suzuki Foundation that spends more than 10 millions of dollars a year, both of which bizarrely get charitable tax-free status for their lobbying work. The billionaires, especially foreign billionaires, are trying to crush our economy. They're trying to put a Canadian face on their foreign manipulations, like we're some colony of the Rockefeller brothers, like we're some trinket or toy like another yacht or a Ferrari for them to drive until they smash it. But they're getting frustrated. Their surrogates aren't doing a good enough job. See, the ventriloquists in San Francisco and New York are getting frustrated with their puppets, so they're not even pretending anymore. Steve Steyer, a left-wing billionaire from California, for example, just couldn't keep his cool anymore. He popped up, and he said he's going to spend millions of dollars to campaign against a fellow Democrat running for Senate from Massachusetts, who dared to support the Keystone XL pipeline. Seriously, could you imagine if some oil billionaire had stood up and said he'd crush any candidate for public office on the other side of the country who dared to criticize the oil industry? I mean, it would be front page news for a week. It would leave evening newscasts, and there would probably be a police inquiry into extortion or threats. No, not even a mention. I mean, the rich billionaires are so impatient. They're quite used to getting their way, you see, and they're quite used to firing errand boys who don't get their orders quite right. I said double half-calf decaf with a twist. You're fired. They're getting impatient, aren't they? Well, who weighed in last week but the Rockefeller brothers' own anti-Canada point man, Michael Northrup. You'll remember his name. It was on the title page of the Rockefeller Brothers Anti-Oil Sands campaign plan. Now, normally, as you know, he prefers to use Canadian puppets, aboriginal if possible, to hide his billionaire white guy from New York roots. But they're just not stopping things fast enough for him. So he came out of the shadows to write an anti-Canada rant in his own name on the Huffington Post. I won't read you the whole thing. It's basically anti-Canada, anti-industry bigotry. Like this lie, for example, Northrop says that the Keystone XL pipeline will, quote, allow Canada to say once and for all that it no longer is possible for their country to commit to a national greenhouse gas reduction target, unquote. But that's not even true. I mean, under Stephen Harper, and even with the oil sands booming, Canada has actually reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 5%. And they're trending down. Now, I think carbon dioxide is a harmless gas that we used to call plant food. But so what? It's going down anyways. But these billionaires hate Canada so much, they'll just plain make things up to destroy our economy. They won't take on China or India or Brazil or OPEC countries, their missions. I mean, that's too tough. So they beat up Canada. There are so many lies in Northrop's piece, but here's a fun one. And I quote, the Keystone XL will create social license for deforesting an area the size of Florida and turning it into the globe's largest open pit strip mine, unquote. Now, Michael Northrop surely knows that 98% of the land area of the oil sands will never be strip mined. The oil sands is just too deep. It'll be produced a mile underground with trees blooming and critters happily frolicking on the surface. But so what, right? Smear Canada, blame Canada, whatever. 
It's easier than actually taking on Saudi Arabia or Iran or Russia, right? I mean, you take on those guys with the truth or with lies, and you could wind up, well, you could wind up like Boris Berezovsky did over the weekend. Who's he? Well, he's a dead man now. He dared to criticize Vladimir Putin, one of the world's largest oil and gas barons. Berezovsky was found dead in his bathtub, just like 21 anti-Putin journalists have been found dead in Russia over the years, just like other anti-Putin expats have been found dead, including by nuclear poisoning. No, no, it's not an assassination. It's coincidence. Yeah, it's more fun to take on Canada, isn't it? Hire some fake Indians, spend a few billion bucks, pretend to save the world, make up statistics, get to hang out with Daryl Hannah and other C-list celebrities. Nah, the Rockefeller Brothers and the Tides Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation... They're not actually about saving the earth. They're about wealth and power. The power to boss you around. And maybe even the power to cost you your job.